This is part three. Okay, now we have a representation of the tone of our guitar signal. How do we know if it's a good tone? What is a good tone? What does that mean? Some guitars sound better than others, right? Right? I think so. So what co constitutes good tone is very subjective. And I promise you that every guitar player has an opinion about what is good guitar tone and what isn't. So this is where the art comes in. We can apply science to it and analyze it, but in the end, it comes down to our own personal interpretation. The fact that good guitar tone is subjective is not going to stop me from looking at the subject. I'm still going to analyze the spectral plots and try to figure out what sounds pleasing and what doesn't. Because we know that there are crappy sounding guitars, right? You can pick up a very poorly sound, sounding guitar and everybody will agree that it sounds like crap. So if that's true, then there must be some truth. So where's the science, where's the art, and where does it begin? So some things we know for sure, and that there are factors that relate to sound quality. The distribution of the amplitudes of the modal frequencies, the width, the frequency span of each mode, the crispness of that, of each mode, each spike on our plot. The signal strength matters. You need good signal strength after all, right? If it's too poor, it's not gonna sound. It's not gonna produce the kind of tone that you need. And then we know that sustain is important. How long the signal remains strong is important in electric guitars. Let's look at an example. I like this example especially because this is actually one of the most popular electric guitar models of all times. If I pluck the high E string and I plot its output signal, it looks like the top plot. Now let's examine that upper right hand corner plot very carefully. The higher frequency modes are actually quite strong compared to the other modes. And another glaring thing about it is that the first couple modes are actually quite low compared to the other modes, especially if you consider that our ears are not very sensitive in that range. There's also kind of a dip right in the middle, centered around 1800 hertz. When I hear that signal through a clean amplifier, the top signal, it sounds like the prototypical sound of this guitar model and to me, my own personal subjective taste, I think it sounds sort of thin and artificial. Now, I'm gonna to try to sculpt it and put it through an equalizer pedal and sculpt the sound a little bit. What I've done is I've boosted the middle frequencies and I've knocked down a little bit of the higher frequencies. And to me, the bottom sound, the bottom signal sounds much better. It just so happens that there are many people who agree with me because the first thing people often do with this particular guitar model is put it through some type of pedal device. For example, an Ibanez Tube Screamer pedal, which not coincidentally also boosts its mids greatly. And let's say a, a very prominent guitarist uh, has a signature model of this particular guitar model that has an onboard mid booster right built in the body of the guitar. So many people, let's say, agree with me that the bottom signal sounds better than the top signal. So what did we learn from this then? If the top plot sounds sort of thin and artificial and the bottom one sounds better, do we need sort of this cascade of very prominent modes in the first few modes and then a cascade downward to the higher frequencies? Is that better sounding? Um, what is it about the guitar that produces the output signal at the top? And is it okay to just scope the output signal? Does the, in other words, does the clean signal out of the guitar matter if we can sculpt it later? Or rather, do we need a very good, well-rounded, sort of pleasing sound right from the start? Let's look at another example. This is an acoustic electric guitar. It both sounds good acoustically and it produces an electrical output signal. In this case, I pluck the D string and I analyze its output. If I listen to this top signal, it sounds noisy to me. It's not very pleasant at all. If I modify the output of this guitar using the equalizer pedal, what, what I do is I boost the signal from 250 to one kilohertz, from 250 hertz to, to 1000 hertz, and I reduce it above 2000 hertz. 
I've added to some of the lower harmonic content and I've drastically reduced the higher frequency noise, I'll call it. The signal looks very different and now it sounds more pleasing to me. To, to me, it sounds more like an instrument actually sounds like acoustically. So I have included the last two examples to give you some feel for these spectral plots and what distribution we're generally looking for. Too much high frequency content is noisy. The modes should be heavy on the first few modes and then they should drop off nicely and evenly at higher frequencies. That's what I feel produces the most pleasing sound, the most pleasing tone. Okay, now let's use our tool for another purpose. Remember how I went to extremes to design my neck joint so that the body and the neck work together as one structural member when they're vibrating? What happens if I loosen the bolts? At full torque value of 25 inch pounds, and I hit the low E string, the signal output looks like the top plot. If I go from 25 inch pounds down to 20, so I'm loosening that joint a little, it looks like the middle plot. If I go all the way down to 15 inch pounds, it looks like the bottom plot. What happened? We're losing information here. As we loosen the neck, there's micro motion that occurs in that joint between the neck and the body. And that micro motion is causing a loss of the higher frequency modes. They're, be, they're being damped, dampened out by that micro motion in the joint. So to me, this is of course vindication for why I went to so much trouble to create such a great neck joint. It's pretty cool that we can analyze the output, output signal of a guitar, but what about the vibrations of the guitar itself, the body and the neck? How do the neck and body vibrate when the strings are vibrating? How does the structural vibration affect the output signal? Does the structure have natural frequencies? Do, does it have natural resonances? And how do they affect the output signal? When we tap a string, it vibrates at its nat natural modes of vibration. So what happens if we tap a guitar? The structure vibrates at its natural modes. Here, I've taken the finite element model that I developed and I'm doing what's called a modal analysis. So here's the first nine modes of its structure. The lowest mode is 33 Hertz. The second is 63 Hertz. The third is 214 and so on. So just like that string, my structure has preferred ways that it wants to vibrate and the frequencies associated with those modes. But this is theory. It assumes very little or no damping in this theory. We know how difficult it is to properly measure and model wood. It's a complex material with a high degree of damping. So how does this compare to reality? To answer that question, we can attach some accelerometers to the guitar and actually measure the vibration of the guitar. An accelerometer is a small mass placed onto a piezoelectric crystal that produces an electrical output signal when it is strained. With this design, the signal output is proportional to the vibration acceleration of this small mass. So we place one accelerometer onto the neck, for example, and a second one onto the body. We might move these around to different locations to get an idea of the vibration mode shapes of the guitar. The first test we'll do is an impact test where we'll lightly tap on the guitar and measure its vibration response. So the first plot that I'm showing is the output signal from the accelerometer after I just tap it. So the signal output, the vibration is high immediately after the tap, but then it decays very rapidly into almost nothing. And that's because wood is so highly damped. If we take that signal and we do a Fourier transform of it, a tap or an impact excites a wide range of frequencies. So all of our structural mode vibrations should appear in this vibration signal. So we're getting a peak, the first peak at 63 Hertz. We're getting another one at 200 Hertz. We get it one at 375 and so on. If we place the accelerometer on the body and we tap, we get some of these same modes, but not all 
not all of them that we see on the neck. They're not as prominent. They're not in our signal to a good enough strength that we can say, yeah, they are there. So our first calculated mode shape of 33 hertz isn't showing up. It's too low, it's too low in the noise level over output and probably too well damped is my guess. But the 63 hertz shows up and so does the 200 and so does the 375. They agree with our analysis. So oh, I'm happy there that there is at least some agreement between the real world guitar and that analysis that I showed on the previous slides. What if we pluck a string and just see the vibration response on the structure after the string is excited and vibrating? Well, we get the vibration on the neck and the body. And then of course we have our output signals and we have the output signal from the pickup and we have the output signals from the accelerometers. Do we see any relationships there in these plots between the three signals? It's very difficult to make any sense of this information, right? We once again go to our old friend Fourier transform, and this time on both the output signal and the two accelerometer outputs. So with just a quick visual, it appears that the string modes are all there on both the vibration data and the signal data. But there's lots of modes here. How can we be sure that there's a relationship? How are they correlating? How does the structure of the guitar vibrating? How is it correlating to the vibration of the string itself? Is there some way that we can somehow compare the signals and see if they have commonality? Now I'm going to introduce a new tool. This tool allows us to compare two signals that have common harmonic content. It's called cross correlation. We have made, here I've made up an example. It's a simplified case where we can visually see that these two signals have the same overall period on the first mode. And they also seem to have a second mode on top of their first signals. And they look similar, don't they? They're a little different amplitude and they're out of phase with each other, but the two signals, don't they look very similar? We might be tempted to say that they are in fact the same signal or very similar. Let's do an FFT of both signals and plot them together on the same plot. We see in this case that their first mode frequency is exactly the same. Their second mode frequencies differ a little, not by much, but by a little. We need a way that will allow us to differentiate between modes that agree and those that don't. We take each of these two signals and we, we compute a cross correlation function. We simply create a new variable tau and we allow it to vary from zero to some large number. So we are shifting the second signal by tau amount. For each tau, we multiply and integrate to create this cross correlation function as a function of tau. So here I'm plotting it. It looks harmonic, doesn't it? What should we do? The same thing we always do in FFT. So here I plot the FFT of the cross cor correlation function along with one of the original signals from above. We see that there is a strong correlation between the two signals for the first mode frequency, but no correlation between the two signals at the second mode frequency. And that's because their frequencies differ. Now let's make up a second example. And this time, let's make both frequencies agree. We can see now in the cross correlation function, there appears to be a second frequency within that function. And when we take the FFT, we see that both frequencies now agree. This magenta curve shown tells us immediately that there is a strong correlation between both frequencies of the two signals. What we've done here is created a new tool that allows us to easily and quickly determine if there is harmonic relationship between the two signals. We can apply this new tool to more complicated signals like those of our guitar. We can apply this new cross correlation tool to compare more complicated signals like the guitar output and the structural output from the accelerometer. Remember these two plots from before? On the bottom graph, I plot the original output signal with the cross correlation function. And we see that yes, indeed, there is strong correlation between the two signals at frequencies up to about three kilohertz, but not that well at frequencies where the guitar signal is weak. 
This cross correlation function is just another tool in our toolbox that can help us to understand the relationship between the structural vibrations of the guitar and the output signal. Go to part four.